Welcome back, everyone. Um, we're going to continue the conversation from this morning about NGOs with a new and exciting panel. My name is Ben Cox. I'm in the Department of Anthropology, a graduate student here. I'd like to welcome everybody back. Um, this panel will go until lunch at about 12.15. For each of the presenters, we'll have about 12 or 15 minutes, and then we should have some time for questions as well. Um, I'll just introduce the panel really quickly now. Our first presenter will be Larry Cooperman. He's the director of Open Courseware here at UCI. Um, a leading consultant in national and international organizations to support global education. I understand he'll be speaking today about the African Virtual University. He's also been a frequent presenter for eLearning Africa. Um, I should say also the, the title of this panel is NGOs, Consortia, Sharing Virtual and Practical Knowledge. So we'll get a little bit of a different taste about the kind of collaborative and structural domains of NGOs and um, interactions with different segments of it. Africa. Um, our second presenter will be Robbie Griffin. He joins us as the son of a fisherman from a small isolated island in Canada. Um, he'll be talking about some work in Guinea, I think? Yes. Yes. He joins us from Athabasca University. Um, third, we'll have Dr. Ken Kirstead joining us from the Lyceum Group. A long and established career, an expert in public health care policy, human resource development in Africa, with a focus on corporate social responsibility. He'll be speaking to us about the work with Lyceum Group, especially in West Africa, um, having been there for about 10 years. And finally, Dr. Deborah Mendry, um, a socio-cultural anthropologist. Um, she has a BA from KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa, an anthropology degree from Irvine. She joins us from UCLA with, uh, from the Center for Culture and Health and the Center for Children and Family, and she'll be speaking especially about um, some of the new agendas with the University of California's Global Health Institute and especially the Women's Health and Empowerment Center for Expertise. So, Larry Cooperman, please start us off. Thanks, Ben. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about the African Virtual University, but I need to uh, start uh, a little bit before that and talk about what's happening in higher education so that we can then think about what's happening in higher education in Africa. In 2009, UNESCO, uh, in its uh, report on uh, higher education, it identified as the central trend um, massification. That is the transition on the one hand from elite to mass institutions uh, and the problem that that creates for everybody everywhere is that as you expand from the 5%, the 6% who used to attend elite institutions of higher education in the United States, for example, to 30 or 40%, and with each percentage that you increase, the average qualification of academics declines. So that this problem that we have universally is how to teach ever-growing numbers. And Sub-Saharan Africa has actually the, uh, one of the highest growth rates in the world in, uh, it in, in entry to, um, from the secondary to tertiary sector. Now, of course, they're starting from a lower baseline. They're starting from 6%. Uh, whereas in the United States, you're talking about uh, the number of people who are enrolled between the ages of 18 and 25 at some point is, uh, is a number in the 80 percent. So you're talking about a very different number. But on the other hand, in Africa, what you see is then the persistence of predominantly the elite institutions. By definition, if you're attending university, you're part of an elite group. So the African Virtual University is a project that aims to expand in some key areas the, the access to higher education. Um, they do this uh, in a first phase of a uh, multinational project with 12 universities in 10 countries by building out what you're looking at here. They build out the classroom. They set up the satellite dish for the internet access. Inside the classroom is the server with 20 computers. And they've admitted in the past year, they've admitted, they've graduated in the past year, 4,000 
secondary teachers in, the, in math and science as part of this project. It was originally funded by the African Development Bank. I should say that the AVU began as a project of the World Bank uh, in the mid-90s, making them one of the oldest distance learning associations and uh, distance learning institutions in the world, but that they became independent from the World Bank very quickly, and, the, uh, and they are actually on a self-sustaining path outside of special projects. So they do consultation for universities, for the International Atomic Energy Association in uh, how to educate people about cancer clusters. They have various projects that actually bring in funds as they operate as a consultant on distance education in the, uh, on the African continent. And then they get special funds, for example, from the African Development Bank to train a new generation of math and science secondary teachers. What they do is a capacity building uh, uh, methodology. So they, don't, they take uh, African professors to develop the content. And it may be, in some cases, there's, you know, when we talk about an African professor, we're talking about a huge variation among the group. Some uh, will have as good access to internet as we have here and others will have no uh, access to internet typically, and because of their generation, they may just be getting on email. So they, set their, they, they provide training on how to actually produce and instructionally design a course for internet delivery uh, in th uh, that's going to eventually be delivered in three different languages. And they prepare these uh, courses via internet, by CD-ROM, and on paper. So you, there's actually a paper textbook where you need it. There's internet access where it's, where it's possible. And they train faculty on how to teach online, which, you know, I started at Berkeley in uh, 1996 when we just started web-based distance learning. And it was a complete mess. You know, we were passing paper passwords that we had found on a screen and we were writing them down on pieces of paper and then handing them off to somebody else who had entered in a different system and then walking the whole thing over four blocks away to make sure that it was in the registration system. That's how we were doing distance learning. So it's not that long ago, actually, if you think about it. We're in 2012, and so some 17 years ago, some 15 years ago, we, were, we had less, uh, a less well-developed infrastructure than what they're using now for the African Virtual University. However, they understand that the end product, besides the math and science secondary teachers, the end product has to also be that the higher education system as a whole is able to use, um, is able to use the, uh, the, the tools of the internet for teaching and learning. Uh, and so capacity building becomes one of the top objectives of this. The second phase, the second multinational um, uh, project is in computer sciences. There's now 27 universities in 25 countries or something like that. The, the, this, to give you an idea what they have to do, is they actually have to get everybody together to agree on what a computer science curriculum looks like. And so at the kickoff for this that was in Nairobi this past year, You'd have uh, everyone from the Rwanda Institute of Science and Technology with a very advanced curriculum and a very uh, impressive track record of what their graduates are able to do. And you're working with somebody like that who's taking their, their uh, computer science curriculum more or less from MIT. And then you're talking about having to harmonize that curriculum with all of the other universities. With the teachers, they did something where they offered optional modules. So no matter what, which way you were teaching science and math to, second, to prospective secondary teachers, they accommodated it. They can no longer do that. Now they have to have people actually come to an agreement about what that computer science curriculum looks like. But that also is highly beneficial because all of a sudden, academics from throughout Africa are discussing and debating what they need to do for this program before you actually start developing the modules. 
and the, you know, the final results of all this is, you know, are students in classrooms. Um, and they have projects in gender equity, they have projects, they have a scholarship program, so, so one of the ways, in fact, if you look at California's history, the way we advanced so rapidly, so quickly after World War II was through the California Master Plan that essentially gave universal higher education at little or no cost to all Californians. And so all of a sudden you have to, free education, and I'm in the kind of the free education movement, the open education movement, um, to get, you, you have to begin with the idea that to advance you have to allow people to access higher education for free. And so this, um, the, the scholarship program is the other way that they do this. So those 4,000 those 4, graduates, they did that, uh, five minutes. So the 4,000 graduates were able to do that because they get scholarships. So they're expanding capacity throughout Africa through this mechanism. And you can see that this is, that we're going through is this process in which starting with elite to mass to universal higher education it is this sort of inevitable process. And it becomes, it be, it, it's, it's, it's inevitable because number one, higher education is the gatekeeper to better lives for people. So what you see is everywhere uh, from the United States where the competition for the elite institutions is extremely <coughs> high. We now, what was it, 70,000 uh, applicants to UCI last year, something like that. We admitted 5,000. Um, so actually, we have this funny thing where even though all this stuff is open and there's a lot of free courses available, the reality is there's there's, as a percentage basis, there's fewer slots available in the elite institutions and competition is actually increased. In Nigeria, 88% of students, of applicants, I'm sorry, of applicants to higher education never get in. That, well, this is already statistics two or three years old. But they, somebody would apply in year one and they would be rejected. So they apply year two after graduation from high school. They'd get rejected. After four years, the students would give up applying. But there weren't enough slots. And this issue of there not being enough slots in elite uh, uh, institutions becomes very important. So all of a sudden, this process, we have to find out ways to reach, to provide access to higher education to more numbers. And we have to do something about the quality of academics. And that's a universal problem. It's not just an African problem. It looks the same everywhere, including in the United States. We have to find a way to use the technologies of distance education that allow us to, um, to, uh, uh, to, to really uh, amplify uh, the access to a professor, for example. We need to use those in order to train the next generation of academics and therefore be able to have a better higher education system for the students in the future. So distance technologies play simply a key role. If you look at India, Indira Gandhi National Open University has three million students at any one time. Mm -hmm. Three million. So India is saying we can't just build universities. We have to reach them and the only way to do it is through distance technologies and they've set up massive institutions uh, to do that. But ultimately this, the direction is to, is to make things available to everybody uh, for free. Um, you, you have to get to a point where, any, where there's no longer a barrier to education. Um, so right now we have financial barriers, we have technical barriers, we have infrastructure problems. Everywhere throughout the world we have to find the way in which anyone who wants to continue on through higher education can. Uh, and so the African Virtual University, the way that I became involved with them, is that they're a key part of the open education movement. So they don't just produce through via distance. They take all of the things they develop and they put it in um, a repository, electronic repository for download. Uh, and they find, for example, at eLearning Africa, a professor came from Malawi and, he's, and the professor um, thanked Bakri Dialu. I think I have a picture of Bakri, here he is. And he thanked the rector of the African Virtual University. He says, your, your teacher education program is wonderful. Thank you very much. We've implemented it. 
And what's great about open education is they implemented it because everything was available for download. The university already had a faculty. The content was superior to what they were using, and they simply had to adopt it. And they didn't have to ask permission. There's no intellectual property barrier on what you've produced when you, when you produce it with a Creative Commons license. And so Bakary Diallo just joined the Open Courseware Consortium. I'm on the board of directors. He's the most recent addition to it. We now have our nine members of that international body. Two of them are from African Open Education Projects. Um, so we have uh, a tremendous, you see Africa taking the lead on this in a lot of ways. And the other, the other group I should mention, Catherine Ngugi, is uh, from OER Health uh, and uh, OER Africa, which is another project that seeks to develop public health curriculum, and they're working now on an open master's degree in public health for Africa. I'm being uh, uh, ushered off the stage, but I, <laughs> but I did want to say what the role that I've been able to play with, with, the, uh, with AVU is th their structure is elected members of the board of directors who have to be vice chancellors of African universities. So I'm a, 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 a co-opted member on the side. But I do things because I travel a lot internationally. I have a number of connections. We were able, for example, to have an agreement made between uh, a, a university system in Brazil that was opening universities in Portuguese-speaking Africa, in Lusophone Africa. And they're now a member of AVU. So the collaboration between university systems is one of the ways we play a role. A second point, I'm and I'm going to leave you on this point because I know my time is up, is that, is that how could, what could we do? Well, to me, the, the, what I would love to see, the project, the fantasy project, uh, would be something like what we do well, which is we're an institution of higher education, is curriculum, to take something like public health, where the UC has a, an emphasis on global health, and to participate uh, because we have uh, the chair of public health here, uh, has his contacts, is the editor of a peer-reviewed journal for African environmental sciences. He has contacts throughout the continent. For us to collaborate in that kind of a manner to develop curriculum that can be delivered through institutions like the African Virtual University to educate a new generation of public health professionals. So with that, I'm going to sit down and uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks, Mr. Cooperman. So now we'll have Robert Griffin. <laughs> Just while I am uh, hooking up, uh, I'm a Canadian attending Athabasca University, which is Canada's open university. Uh, I will say that open does not mean free, uh, <laughs> at least at the doctoral level. Uh, Tuition is very expensive. They're trying to compete with the American universities and are charging uh, that kind of uh, tuition, so kind of interesting. Um, uh, I became interested in Africa a number of years ago, and uh, I come from a very isolated rural community in eastern Canada. It's an island uh, in the middle of nowhere, an uh, hour and a half ferry trip to the mainland, and then once you get there, you're still nowhere. And uh, <laughs> so I had to, uh, I had to, you know, five hour drive from there to go to university for my undergraduate program. By that time, being from a rural community, you're expected to marry. You know, I was 21, 22, and uh, that's expected. And so you get f uh, familial obligations and financial obligations, and I did not do any graduate work after my undergraduate program. Uh, it was not until uh, the internet came along and then we have distance education that I could actually uh, progress with my uh, own learning. And so I did my uh, master's from Memorial University in Newfoundland, and I'm presently doing the first doctorate program in Canada, uh, and I'm doing it in distance education from Athabasca University. I, I tell you that bec because I understand a little bit of what it's like to live in a rural, isolated community and not have access to uh, education. 
I certainly would like to thank uh, Cecilia and her team for organizing this conference. Uh, I really enjoyed the debate and the uh, discussion, and it certainly broadens my uh, approach. Um, four or five years ago, I was reading some, uh, some uh, papers out of uh, World Health Organization and UNESCO, and they were promoting distance education in rural developing world as a solution. Uh, for educational needs. Not enough schools could be built, not enough teachers could be trained. They didn't have money to pay that many teachers, but they thought that distance education might overcome some of the barriers. I was also reading an article that time that was chastising Western universities for not helping. Why weren't the Western universities giving the assistance to the developing countries of the world to help set up distance education programs? They weren't doing much in their own countries, let alone uh, helping anyone else, but it's interesting. Uh, and so some projects certainly have gone ahead uh, in developing countries, mostly around cities. Uh, some of the early research was uh, sampling you know, on university campuses. What is the difference between students attending a live face-to-face uh, -face, uh, classroom and a virtual classroom? The results said that uh, you know, the learning going on was roughly the same. Students didn't like the virtual classroom. Why would they take that when they could go to a face-to-face -face classroom, ask questions, and so on? So, but that, that was the early research uh, in developing countries with distance education. What I wanted to do is, well, yeah, people in the city, even in developing countries, at least have access. But what about if you live in a community that has no internet? What if you have no or limited cell service? There's no electricity. There are no postal service. The population is illiterate, and they speak only their native language. Do these people not deserve the right to have education? And so that became my challenge. If we look at the growth of distance education over the last few years, and it's really not that old, uh, we understand that we evaluate what students have, and then you determine what they need, and you develop content, and then you test the material. You send it off to the student, whatever method you are using. The student learning occurs, you evaluate the student learning, and then the cycle continues. And so that's the model that has been used. Uh, we started distance education with basically what I would call course in a box. Uh, you know, you type up the material, you put it in a box, you mail it off to the student, he reads it, you evaluate the student in some way, and you carry on from that. He gets his course, his learning. Uh, then we had televised uh, courses. We still use those in some parts of uh, Canada. There are some universities still putting out courses on television. Uh, and then we became online, and we did asynchronous courses, and now synchronous courses. My uh, program is all live, we meet on Tuesday night, uh, all the students are there, we ask questions, we talk to one another, the professor presents, we present, it works well. So can distance education be delivered by e-learning became my question because I don't have the internet in the community in which I'm working. So I'm using design-based research because I also come from a business background before I uh, got into education. And so I understand how business works. And I understand design-based research from a business model. And that's where I started. And now, of course, the social sciences are using design-based research. So it fit well with what I was familiar with doing. There is a need for a product. We have a population in uh, developed rural, rural countries that need education. Uh, you meet with the client, with the people in the community who want to educate. Uh, you brainstorm ideas on how to do that. You develop some sort of prototype. You test the product, and then you market the idea, or it can be scalable uh, in other areas. And so that was the approach that I took originally. You also have to look at what is the need and also what is the process that you're going to use. You have to approach cost on both of those and uh, who is going to pay. I mean, those are things that are realities, even in 
the developing country. Somebody has to pay. And who is going to uh, do that? And does it just become a model where only the rich can afford it? And if not, how can we resolve those sorts of problems? I was fortunate in that I had a tremendous mentor through one of the cohorts uh, in my doctoral program. She was a native elder of the Cree Nation uh, in northern Ontario. And when she heard that I was going to do my research in Africa, and having known me for a few months, uh, she said, we have to talk. She said, there are some things that you need to know before you go on any further. And she said, number one, when you go to Africa, don't say anything, just listen. <laughs> and that's the best advice I could have ever received. She also said that if it doesn't come from the people, that you're working with, it's not going to work. Good advice. So I went to Africa with very preconceived ideas of what I was going to do. I was going to develop a distance education for Guinea in Western Africa. And I was going to teach them maybe university courses. But if they weren't ready for that, then I'd start with high school. And I even approached my provincial government who had high school courses all ready to go in French because a third of our province is French and uh, started the process of what about uh, putting these courses uh, online in Guinea and wouldn't that be great and we, we were you know having some good discussions with that. So I followed my mentor's advice and I went to Africa this summer and we sat down with the people in a clinic who wanted a distance education program and they needed to get some basic health information out to their population. So I was a little deflated, wasn't teaching high school courses. And then we started talking about what the needs of the community were. And in my mind, you know, you're going to Maslow's hierarchy. You know, food, clothing, shelter, and you keep working your way up. And uh, I found that basic health care was number one. That was the most important need. Because if a child doesn't live beyond a year because of health issues, you don't have to feed and clothing. So that comes before growing food. That comes before finding shelter and clothing for that child. Because he can live on his mother's milk for a year, but if he's sick and he's dying of disease, he's not going to make it to the next phase. And being the Canadian boy, even from an isolated uh, community, I found that shocking. But I didn't say anything. I kept my mouth closed, as I was told to do, and I listened. And so they said, you know, it would be great. We do need education. We need a primary school, because they don't have a primary school in the community I was working. Uh, their school had collapsed. But they said, before that, we need to improve the health of our citizens in our community. And so we sat down and decided that health care would be number one that we needed to get out some basic information. And we had, at this clinic, one doctor, one pharmacist, and 15,000 patients. And they were overwhelmed, and they were dealing with life and death every single day. The clinic was overwhelmed. That was the number one thing that I found out. They had a need to educate the population on basic health care. I found out they had no electricity, no postal service, no internet, poor cell service, none in some of the areas that the local language was Susu, and that's what they understood, period. The caregivers were the women. They were mostly illiterate, so we couldn't publish anything or print anything or put out information that way. I also discovered that, because by this time I'm thinking I'm going to do video. You know, we'll video the doctor, we'll video the clinic director, and we will be able to put out information that way. Uh, Research told me, because I am research-based, that videos had to be short, two minutes. Because there's a lot of uh, research and documentation that's saying that if you're going to put out videos on distance education, they have to be relatively short. And I was immediately told that not in our culture. In our culture, an oral culture, you put out information and you repeat it and you make sure they understand it and you review it and you ask questions. 
So my two minute videos became 15 minute videos, which was interesting. And I argued with that. That's the only time I really fought. And they said, we don't care. We're not doing two minute videos. If we're going to do them, they're going to be 15 minute videos. So that was interesting. And that I needed to understand the cultural protocol. And I had been told that by my mentor back in Canada, but I didn't understand it until I was actually there. So it was important that if this project, this research project was to be successful and scalable, that we had to have permission at many levels for it to go ahead. Uh, I met with the uh, government officials. Uh, I started with the, one of the vice presidents of the country, met with him for three hours. He was a very gracious man, uh, Bishop Gomez. I met with the chef de Cartier once I got into the district of Bofa, and again, he certainly was very happy with the project. And then I had uh, meetings with the village chiefs and the elders. Uh, community meetings were extremely important, uh, but you had to be introduced properly. You had to do a tour of the village, see the tourist sites, which I found interesting in each village. And then we could sit down with the uh, chief and the elders and discuss it. And then you had to meet the women of the community who were going to be taking the courses. So I found that the population was receptive to technology, so that was great. Uh, we did some brainstorming on our solution. We decided that we would do eight videos. The first one on sanitation and hygiene. We would do cholera, typhoid, malaria, diabetes, dysentery, and other gastric problems. Diabetes, because that's huge there. It's a very uh, uh, carb-high diet. Uh, and tuberculosis and other respiratory problems. You notice what's missing? AIDS. They don't have an AIDS problem. It's a Muslim community, and the AIDS was only in the Christian communities. Found that fascinating. What does that say about... But they didn't have an AIDS problem. And that, they didn't. But I thought that was interesting. The only AIDS issues were in the small Christian communities in Guinea, and this community was all Muslim. Uh, I videotaped uh, uh, the doctor and the uh, director they did it all in Susu, and that was very important when uh, I, I met with the village chiefs. Uh, the first chief I met with said, are you going to do these lessons in English? And I said, no. He said, that's good. We don't understand English. We're working through an interpreter. He said, are you going to do them in French? And I said, no. He said, that's good. We don't understand French either. And I said, I'm going to do them in Susu. And he said, that's good. We understand Susu. So that, you know, it's the mindset that, you know, immediately he was receptive because I had the native people talking to him in his native language. We asked permission. We went through proper channels. We went through the protocol. We met the women of the village, and they said, yes, this is something that we've been looking for and that we want. It was also important that I worked through the clinic because they had so much respect uh, for the uh, clinic. So where do we go from here? Uh, I, I did my ground research uh, back in uh, August. Uh, uh, I'm writing, uh, finishing up my thesis proposal now. In March, I'll return to uh, Guinea. Uh, I'm taking five iPads. Uh, I am uh, putting them in five villages. Uh, they're powered with solar packs. I will have uh, a young guy in each village who will look after it. Um, the women will view the uh, courses. We set up a schedule for them. That's all explained in the initial uh, video. In August, I'll return to uh, Guinea, determine the level of learning that has taken place, evaluate if behavior has changed, and then we'll assess the scalability, reliability, and validity of the program. I'm out of time. I uh, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciated the opportunity to present here today. Thanks a lot, Robbie. Now, uh, Dr. Ken Kustad. I don't I don't need a computer. I don't need a translator. I don't need notes with me. But uh, I do need an epidemiologist to answer those questions. <coughs> It's, it's a delight to be here. I want to congratulate the meeting and the organizers of the meeting at UCI for this excellent organization. It's stimulating. I feel jealous. I feel threatened. I feel intimidated. 
But I know that what I'm doing is absorbing the thoughts and the psyche of people that are here who all have so much to do with Africa where I was born and where I have spent a lot of my life working. So it's a real pleasure to be with you. And Cecilia, congratulations. And to the staff who've made everything so well organized for us all. Many of you have been to South Africa, right? To South Africa? How many hands? Just a few. Well, quite a few. How many of you have been in KwaZulu? How many of you know where Pongolo Le Bombo Mountains are? Somebody does. You know. That's where I was born and brought up. I was born and brought up on the border of Mozambique, Portuguese, East Africa, and Swaziland, just in a little corner of South Africa. In 1960, 1945, I started school in KwaZulu. And there were no public schools for white people. In fact, I didn't even know that I was white at that time because I grew up in a rural community. My first day of class, I was with 26 other students, and somebody was clever enough to take a picture of us, this, the little class of kids, five years old at that time. And many, many years later, the picture was being shown in North America, and somebody who's quite well educated said, which one is Ken? <laughs> <laughs> slip of the tongue, I think, or slip of, con of concentration at that moment. I say that not as a joke, but as a profound beginning point. When color is not of consequence, when the blending of colors is normal. I work in Africa and have worked in Africa for about 45 years in 13 countries from time to time, from places as remote as Congo Brazzaville, in Nigeria, in Zambia, in South Africa, but mostly in French West Africa. And in that period of time, what I have seen in my own family, which were missionary origin, who married locally in many cases, in my family, they were kicked out of South Africa for obvious reasons at that point in time and migrated to Zimbabwe and Zambia and Botswana. And now we are this mosaic of Kirsteds, which I'm very proud of. So the world is changing. I work in a country that is Muslim, 85%, 10% Christian, 100% animist. <laughs> the first vice president of the country who Robbie met with and identified as Bishop Gomez, an Anglican bishop. Very small minority in terms of the religion, but in terms of the acceptability in the culture and knowledge of the people, he is accepted as the leader and the teacher that he is. There's a change. 10 years ago, we started an NGO in Guinea, echoing sentiments of people here. I went to Guinea first with an invitation from the government to have a look at what the country needed. Imagine asking somebody from outside to come and tell you that. It was ridiculous. I went and I did what Robbie did. I listened, I listened, I listened. And what did we find out? That Guinea needed rural development programs in the worst possible way, and we should start an NGO. So I talked to people in the city of Conakry, and I said, what kind of an NGO should we start? First of all, tell me what kind of NGOs are in the country. There were 157 NGOs in Guinea at that time in a country ranked about at the bottom of the economic ladder in the world. And when I tried to find out what they did, it was like some of you said, all I saw was a parade of white, emblazoned insignia and signia vehicles with the chauffeur driving people back and forth to meetings. Mm -hmm. What these NGOs were doing, I spent a few weeks actually visiting installations where they were working. You know, I had a hard job to find out what they were doing. I'm not being sarcastic, I'm just being very straightforward with you. Went to one NGO that was doing health care, emblazoned with insignias from the Canadian Industrial Development Organization, from the World Health Organization, etc. But there wasn't a patient there. So I said, how come? It's a beautiful building, it's a lovely facility, why not any patients? And they said, well, we start off with a prayer meeting in the afternoon, 
And if we get through the prayer meeting, then we will see the patients. And I had to stop myself from grabbing the person and becoming violent. <laughs> you can't be serious, was my statement. You really can't be serious. Six people, sick people have to wait until they go through a prayer meeting. I'm, I'm not against prayer meetings at all, but this was a shocker to me. NGOs work in the country, but there's no self-empowerment of the people. NGOs work in, in the country with big business siphoning off funds that are used by the government. In Guinea, 82% of our budget money comes from donated institutional funds classified as aid. All the new black cars with the chauffeurs are bought for by aid money. All the ministers' houses are bought for by aid money. I'm serious, it's true. And if any of you have ever been in Guinea, you'll see that it's true. Something had to be done that was different. In the last little while, I've had the privilege of visiting some businesses here in Orange County, and I'm amazed at the complexity and the money that is available in this kind of a place. And when you talk about the NGO activities here, that's why I said I'm jealous. I'd like to become part of your NGO network here because there's a lot more money here than there is in New Brunswick or in Guinea. But uh, I've been learning about what are called the, what is your landing strip rate? How much money have you got until you run out of money? And I had a hard job to understand that because my mind immediately went to what is the bleed rate from aid money going into Africa? And how fast is that bleed going to consume all of the funding that is available for the organizations there? As Robbie said, and I'd like to say that Robbie visited our facilities in West Africa, and we were able to spend a few weeks together there. 15,000 people, there is no infrastructure, zero. There's one main road that goes through. The rest of the roads are atrocious. You have to have a four-wheel drive vehicle. My wife, Lynn, who's here with, with me today, she lived with me in Africa for two months this year, and we survived, our, our marriage survived. In <laughs> miracle. <laughs> There's underfunded infrastructure in every respect. We work in an area that has the richest history of the ancient African slave trade, of the past slave trade, that you could ever imagine. The area we are in is called the Rio Pongo. There are five rivers that come down from the Futa Jalon Mountains. And almost every village we work in was a slave trading station. We still are able to pick up shackles and bars and containment metal, prows of boats that were used to, to shepherd and take the slaves to Senegal and then on from Senegal, Il Gori, to Latin America and to North America. That's where we work. In the evening, sitting on the upper veranda, from here to that next building is where the slaves were. At the same time, between there and here, there are graves of Egyptian, I'm sorry, not Egyptian, Greek, German, French, Canadian, American, British missionaries who all died in the cause of getting civilization in the terms that we know it to the people of Guinea. I want to just comment briefly and then I'll be done. Five minutes, okay. Um, there's so much to say and so little time to say it, but I would like to comment on a few things. We've talked about the trickle-down effect of money, that in spite of the high percentages of burn rate of money that's provided by aid organizations and institutions, and that overhead cost can be as high as in some audited cases that we have copies of the audits, runs up to about 86%. In other words, 14% actually makes it to the country where the donation is supposed to go, and probably even less into the village, like Dominja, where we work, where the rural people have absolutely nothing, not even one meal a day. We'd like to stop the cars at the end of the road, but we can't. We have to be open-minded and open-hearted at the same time. 
We had a change of government a few years ago. I was in Guinea working when 157 people were shot dead in Conakry <coughs> by the forces of the government who was trying to stay in power. 1,000 people were hospitalized in Donka. I was there. 1,000 people in a hospital that had no aspirin, had no bandages, no sutures, nothing. We did mercy shipments down from Mali, where I also work, Bamako, and brought down food and medical supplies into that impoverished area. The aid organizations were not there. I called a FAO, and FAO said, it's not on our agenda. So people are hungry and they're dying and the cost of rice is going through the ceiling and it's not on their agenda, excuse me. It should be. It should be on everybody's agenda. The new president who's come into Guinea is a very fine man by all present measurements. He's clamped down on corruption. We cannot transfer $1,000 into Guinea now that is not tracked, tracked through the state bank and proper representation being made and given for the use and the dispersal of those funds. He's clamped down on corruption. You know what's happened in the villages? All of a sudden, the village people are becoming very upset because there was a trickle-down effect from corruption, not just from aid. But the trickle-down effect was keeping people employed and keeping money and food on the table. So our best laid plans of mice and men often go awry and often don't work. Does that mean we stop? Absolutely no. What it does mean is that people like you and others who become deployed with a passion and a life within you, your heart is beating for Africa, don't stop it. As I say to the people in Africa when they say, why are you here? And I say to them, je suis un ancien Sud-Africain. I'm an old South African. Ah oui, bon, bienvenue. You're welcome, stay with us. <laughs> so in closing, I just want to say that our affiliations, our work in Africa could not happen without affiliations. I'm begging for an affiliation with UCI. Cecilia, I'm looking at you. We'd like to be associated. We are affiliated with the Agence de la Musulman de l'Afrique, the Muslim agencies that look after the country. We've done dis dispersal of wheelchairs with them, medicines and various things like that. We are part of the Anglican Diocese of West Africa in that the Bishop of West Africa is on our board for West Africa. We are part of Pamoja, and I am just going to be finished in one minute. Pamoja is a consortium of 57 NGOs in West Africa that all work on a unified front to reduce alphabetization deficiencies and to help the causes of women. You can't do it yourself, is my point. You have to become part of a larger cause. I have a recommendation to make, though, as I make to corporate people who I work with as a consultant due to my past careers. We need a mechanism that keeps us all online and in the realm of responsibility and also in the realm of compliance. A self-assessment tool that we could voluntarily say, assess us, check us out, look at our books, look at our figures, and make sure that we are part of what is right. Ultimately, if we became a cooperative of people in various organizations such as I've heard today, we could have somebody do that for us and to raise the credibility. Why am I saying this? Because credibility today is going awfully fast with the reduction of cash, with the increase of corruption, with countries that are just living on the edge of desperation all the time. It's up to us to find a solution, not only raise the issue of what the issue is. There must be a cause, there must be a solution as well. That's my request to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kirstead. And our final presenter will be Dr. Deborah Mendry. Just give me a second. Yeah, go right ahead. Okay, so I'm here today to talk to you not about Africa, not about my work. Um, in uh, Africa, we're just focused on HIV and safer conception for people with 
there, Debbie. But instead, I'm going to talk to you about a group that I've gotten involved with uh, that is uh, here at, through the UCs and an effort within the UCs. Um, three years ago, um, is that you? we, is that you? yes, okay. thank you. Uh, three years ago, um, UC Global Health Institute, uh, well, actually four years ago, UC Global Health Institute was created. It has three centers of expertise. Um, one of them is called One Health, which focuses on um, health and the environment and the interaction between um, the environment and animals and humans in terms of maintaining health. Uh, the other center of expertise is migration and health, looking at issues related to migration globally um, and healthcare. And then the center that I'm part of is the Women's Health and Empowerment Center of Expertise. What's interesting about um, the uh, various centers is that what the effort is, is to try to bring the expertise from all of the UCs together and bring people from different disciplines speaking to one another to think about these issues. Um, and I have to say, it is, in the spirit of what we've been dealing with here, it, we struggle too within these different centers when you bring people with different kinds of disciplinary perspectives and different kinds of expertise. Um, we have an incredible, the UC is an incredible wealth of expertise of people um, and people who are working all over the globe. Um, but it really takes a commitment as it does for something like has been organized here for the past two days. It really takes a commitment on everybody's part to be patient with one another as you try to work through your different perspectives and figure out how do you move forward together. Um, so, you know, like, for example, just a small little example of one of the struggles for me personally, I'm an anthropologist. Many of the people uh, in our center of expertise are uh, medical professionals or public health professionals. We have lawyers, uh, we have uh, sociologists, psychologists. But when we were trying to fund student fellowships to go and do uh, projects on women's health and empowerment, um, one of the members of our group was like, well, we had a few proposals from people who were proposing doing work here in the United States. And some of our members were like, well, why would we fund the United States? This is supposed to be global health. We're doing it everywhere else. And we were like, no, global health is the United <laughs> States also. It's part of the globe. You know, so little conversations like that of trying to get people to think through that. But I'll give you, so the main mission is really to try and address women uh, women and girls, empowerment and health, that does not mean that we do not pay attention to men. We do look at issues to do with men, and in fact, one of our partner organizations is Sonke Gender Justice, which is um, an organization based in South Africa focused on men and mobilizing men and, and attending to issues that impact men and women. <laughs> um, so our mission is to promote justice, equity, and scientific advances to reduce gender and health disparities globally. Um, and, um, oh, where is that not working? There we go. Um, so one of the debates we also have is around these whole issues of our vision of empowerment and what does empowerment mean? Um, and that's a kind of ongoing dialogue. Some of our work in this context is also developing various instruments because in some professions, particularly in the health sciences, they like to have instruments to be able to measure things, but then we kind of have this debate of what does that mean. Um, so we look at addressing the causes of empowerment, improving women's access to and control over current and future resources, using improved access to resources and decision making to achieve individual and collective well-being and health. And um, the key components is to focus on the interplay and interconnectedness of women's empowerment and health. So it's not just addressing women's health, but how do we actually address empowerment in that context? Um, and conducting research on women's empowerment and health and connecting research with education and the training of new leaders. 
um, from various kinds of disciplines. And it's been very interesting when we've brought people from uh, the law departments who get involved with us who are not used to sort of thinking through well, what does it mean to advocate for justice? And then how do you actually translate that into everyday life and into healthcare outcomes and stuff like that? And how do you know that what you're doing is having any kind of effect? So we've had interns who've gone to work with uh, Soke Gender Justice, for example, who've actually then gone and looked at some of their projects, like uh, the project in South Africa where the South African government has a policy that when people report rape, there's a certain set of guidelines of what should happen. And so one of our law students went and did research to follow, looking uh, throughout the Cape, the Western Cape province, what procedures were being followed and what not, and what was going on and what seemed to be the challenges and to try to look at what that actually meant. I give that just as an example, but people are doing, in, in this group, are doing work all over the world. And we have multiple projects all over the world. Um, we have folks from the health sciences, from nursing and midwifery, from medicine, from public health, and we have folks from anthropology, law, sociology, the arts and culture, and from psychology. Um, I actually co-chair the education committee. So our goal, I, I've talked a little bit about some of our research work, but our goal is to actually focus on how are we going to develop an education that focuses on women's health and empowerment. Um, and how do we do that? The, the difficulty is how do we do that across disciplines and for the moment across campuses, across the UC campuses? Uh, for the last two years, we've run a summer institute on women's health and empowerment, an intensive uh, course, four, a four credit, four credit, course that's run for two weeks at UCLA with an interdisciplinary team of faculty. It's been very challenging because we get challenged by the UCs, uh, by the various departments. We always have to figure out where we're going to host this within the UC system and the structure that works. How do people from other campuses get credit taking this? And also, the departments that host it often say to us, well, why do you need four faculty to teach this? And why do we have to pay for four faculty? <laughs> and we have to say, well, we need people from different disciplines. Um, and we're now in the um, process of trying to develop a certificate. We've also done some other lecture series and so forth, and we're in the process of trying to develop um, uh, a certificate in women's health and empowerment. So our vision at this point is to try to create a UC-wide interdisciplinary set of courses related to women's health and empowerment. We've actually done an analysis across all of the UC campuses, any courses that relate to women's health and empowerment. We came up with a list of close to 700 courses, and we've whittled that down because we're now trying to look at which really actually apply because we're looking at different areas, gender theory, empowerment theory, um, health um, courses and then courses that integrate health and empowerment issues. We've also started to try to figure out how we're going to make this available to students across all of the UC campuses. We've piloted that with a course that's offered at the UCSF Global Health Masters Program, where we offered a course and students from UCLA were also enrolled. And it's, I'm sure Larry knows all of these kinds of issues of how do you actually make it feasible that people get credit in the whole process, all the, all the infrastructural questions. And then the next, so we're getting ready in the next year or two to try to launch that. We're going to be having a meeting in February to define the core competencies in this Women's Health and Empowerment Certificate. And UCI, the program in global health here, is very interested in this. Uh, Dr. Brandon Brown, who couldn't be here today because he's in Puerto Rico doing at a conference there. but. He um, is very interested in making that happen here at UCI, and UCSF uh, will be another site, and we might have some others, and so we're going to try to launch this through the UCs. But the reason I bring it also to this, this group is that we also plan on then making this available, and Larry's going to be somebody we're going to have to meet with and talk with to get advice, to make this available globally um, so that people in NGOs or people at universities who are research partners or who simply, who may not be research 
partners, but who simply want to be able to get some expertise in this area can become enrolled. So we're kind of experimenting with the distance learning issues here within the UC system, but then we're going to be looking to expand that to our partners globally. And there are lots of challenges, as Larry's talk was um, addressing, in terms of trying to make that happen. But there are lots of, um, and since Larry already spoke about some of these kinds of opportunities, I'm not going to go into that. I was going to do that today, but I think he, he addresses it far more competently than I can. But that's the vision that we have, is to make that happen, so that people who are working in NGOs who are concerned about women's health can maybe get some of the expertise to think through some of these issues more carefully that they're trying to address um, and have some of those expertise. Or in areas like Guinea, where there maybe aren't resources, but there are people interested in women who would like to be able to <coughs> develop some of the skills necessary to address those things, would be able to take courses. And so we'll have certain courses that become kind of the main structure of the Women's Health and Empowerment Certificate. Um, and then there'll be numerous electives that would be offered, and it would be trying to get the UC system to start figuring out how they can make some of the courses that we have offered here available as downloads or in other kinds of means uh, that people all around the world could access. Uh, and, and then we can kind of use this, the expertise from UC to, to make a difference globally. Okay. Okay, it oh, looks like we have you. about 15 minutes before lunch. Um, we'll take maybe two, three questions, and then we'll start with Cecilia and then come here. So Deborah, I've, since we were talking from the last panel about imagery, and, and you said that we need to have more intensive discussions yeah. about these things, yeah. I want to ask you what your reflections are about the first image yes. of the women who are clearly African women right. who are sitting passively waiting to be empowered. That's one right. way to think about it. Right. Right. And so do you have... Did you have discussions about that image? We what? do. We constantly have discussions about images. And it's an ongoing process trying to get people to understand some of the problematics of some of the images. Right. Mm -hmm. And then we, um, at various times, have been able to make changes to some of those. But it's really an ongoing dialogue. And I have to say, it is. It's very challenging when you work from different perspectives and trying to get people to understand what those issues, why these things are issues, and and why they're problematic. Um, and part of what keeps me hanging in with a lot of this work is that there are so many different contexts, as I think our various talks over the last couple of days have been indicating, there are various contexts where there really is a tremendous need, you know, when, um, Ken was talking about just not being services in certain areas. I mean, there's certain parts um, of the world where you literally just don't have doctors with certain kinds of expertise. And so doctors are actually doing a lot of interesting things with kind of using virtual technology as a way to deliver healthcare in those areas. So I think a lot of what they're doing has the potential to really build these partnerships where people can share expertise and gain access um, to whether it be experts or knowledge. Um, and, and part of that process, too, uh, in the context of our research group, is realizing we don't need to bring people from African countries or from Asia or whatever here. People are doing the work that they're doing in their different contexts. So part of it is how do we actually use this as an exchange, and the problem for people here, particularly in the health sciences, is they don't know the contexts that they want to do their work in. And they don't understand what is going on in those local contexts. So some of that, once we get to that stage of the virtual university, some of that will also be those students who are here having to take courses that are offered in universities in some of those other countries where they plan on going to do work. And it's a kind of ongoing process. There's, we, we talked a lot about NGOs and missionaries and stuff like that. There are huge numbers of health professionals traveling globally, doing work all over the world. 
with the very kinds of things we were talking about before, with these notions of good intention and wanting to make a difference, and seeing a real gap and a real need of complete lack in some circumstances of services, in other circumstances, services um, available, but figuring out some of the problems to act properly delivering, delivering those services, or ways in which, I mean, global problems like with HIV prevention, how do you prevent HIV? I mean, there's, this is a problem everywhere in the world, that as much work as we do on trying to do HIV prevention, we continue to see the spread of the disease, and nobody's beat <laughs> HIV. Um, so, so I think it's part of that ongoing dialogue, and the difficulty, I, I'm hoping that more people in the social sciences will become engaged with the Women's Health and Empowerment Center of Expertise, because I think the more we have people who have the kind of perspectives that we have, who can call into question these notions of what do you mean by empowerment, and why do you want to measure empowerment, and what kind of measures of empowerment, a lot of these things are highly problematic for me. But at the same time, I feel like if I'm not part of working with some of these groups, they just wouldn't even be looking at these questions. <laughs> so that's a very long answer to your short question. You could ask the question. Yeah, I was just going to say that it's interesting that the community in which I am working have not had any NGOs. Uh, and I found the women to be extremely empowered. Uh, very much so. Exactly. Uh, they, they, they run their, their village. Uh, exactly. There's no other way to look at it. And if you want to do anything, you certainly need their permission. Exactly. Uh, and uh, they know exactly what they need. Yeah. And all, we, all I was doing there was to provide a model or a method in which they could achieve what they wanted to achieve. Exactly. Um, so I, I don't think it's fair to say that women are empowered everywhere because right. certainly in many countries of our, our communities in which I saw, they, they certainly were. Yeah. What they did need though was a little bit of help. And the very last day that I was uh, in Guinea, uh, I had a discussion uh, with some people and one woman asked me, and she knew the answer. She said, you're from Canada, how much do you pay for health care? And I said, well, I, I don't, it's, it's free. She said, why don't you pay? <laughs> and I said, well, I don't have to. And she said, but you have a good job. Mm. Why aren't you paying anyway? Why, why are you a burden to your government? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, it made me stop and think a little bit. And I had to change slightly my thoughts on uh, Medicare. She's saying, who built the hospital in your community? Mm -hmm. You have a small community, not much larger than ours. I said, well, the government did. And she said, our government can't. Mm -hmm. So we just need a little bit of help finishing our hospital, because they've done as much as they can. They built the walls, they have a roof on, they need a bit of help finishing it. But she said, help us finish it, and we'll show you how to run it. Mm -hmm. uh, so they were certainly very empowered, knew exactly what they wanted. Exactly. They did need a little bit of help, but it's help that all of us in uh, North America have had. We just didn't look at it in that way. My community would not have a hospital if somebody had put it there. Yes, exactly. It's about providing resources to people. Exactly. It is. It's and they know what the they right want and what they need the right and give them the opportunity and they'll show you how they can do it. Exactly. Thanks. Ellis, did you have a question? Yeah, I wanted to ask, ask a question about the online to access, universal access to online learning or distance learning. While the university does issue a statement and they enter into a consultant, maybe they, 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 there are 15 universities where they're going to have online learning. But a colleague of mine who is in the English department um, sent me a petition that she wanted to send to the president. And her concern was that even though uh, all the universities who are part of that consultant, all their students would have free access to the online courses. Uh, the platform is, is managed by a for-profit group. So her concern was that uh, and this for-profit group to make money would have to recruit paid customers. So the question I have would be when uh, you have, even if the content provided by the university is free, 
for their uh, for member of their consortium. What if you have the conflict with these pay customers? Isn't that going to um, to be uh, a, a big challenge? And isn't uh, this group, the platform owners, and they're going to be more trying to get as many customers as they want? And what are the ethical challenges? So that's the question. And you raised a question at the end of your presentation, and I think it was also, I wanted to raise that uh, from the previous uh, um, speakers. And it's about audit. When you talk about a group self-assessment uh, tool, which kind of made me kind of almost jump because that was Wall Street one for the time. They want the government off their back. They just want to self-assess themselves until they drop everybody else in the ditch. <laughs> so uh, the question I wanted to ask is that uh, uh, that audit culture, is it, and, and you mentioned how it may, it may actually help increase the credibility of NGOs, the compliance the responsibility, which is a very good thing. But when we talk in terms of credibility, which is the ultimate capital a, a not-for-profit association may have, are we already kind of bordering the notion of the humanitarian market? In a sense, if an NG, this NGO A get, let's say, A rating, they're more likely going to increase the capacity to raise money. So that's one point. And I'm asking, is this also, I think you mentioned that, is this also motivated by the fact that uh, the market is saturated, that the, the resources are limited? And, and ultimately, if we have this audit culture, there's this conflict between accountabilities to the donors, which sometimes really enter into conflict with the needs of the population on the field. So these are more comments, and, and we can provide some response. Uh, to the first part, uh, I'll respond to the first part, which is, is, so imagine there's a consortium of 15 universities, and they say, all of our students, these 15 universities, can access these courses that we've developed. So the first question is, why just your students? You know, why are you limiting it? What isn't the role of a university to share knowledge, first and foremost? And that's the reason why open education solves that need because it goes beyond the university into the community and says everybody has access to this. Um, and the, the second part is, you know, there's a commercial provider, you know, I'm not against the commercial provider if they do a good job for a reasonable fee and it's efficient. Uh, the African Virtual University uses an open source package that's that's free for anybody to download and install, so they don't uh, they don't have the, the same issue. But the big the big issue really is, and and Kenya has has begun to address this to say that when resources are educational resources are developed with public funds, the product is publicly owned, which means everybody gets to share it. And this is actually is already filtered down to professors. It's it's sort of they don't quite, people don't quite even understand it yet because it's you know an edict. It's a, it's a mandate, but so is open courseware at MIT. It was a mandate from the from the president of uh, of MIT that this is what we will do. Um, and it, out of that beginning opens the door then that all of the course materials that they're developing individually get put into repositories where it's shared. And there you have then the opportunity to go beyond the, the smaller elites that are able to actually attend day by day and begin to open the doors. And certainly the cost of curriculum development has just, will be slashed by having done it. There's an efficiency to open education that uh, is is the is the main reason why beyond just distance technology, we also need to keep content open because that allows curriculum to travel uh, very easily. Uh, on the subject you brought up, it's a very very good point. If we look at what is it that needs compliance regulation or compliance audit or even surveillance. The number of NGOs operating in the world are phenomenal in terms of numbers. Many of those NGOs actually don't exist. What do you mean? They raise money, but they do nothing with that money. Or the money is used in a self-serving manner. 
And I'm not, this is not bragging rights, but I know two presidents' wives in Africa who have huge NGOs. Their money is being donated by Western philanthropic organizations. But that money is not being used as help to the local people and to the local community. The problem is the definition of what an NGO should be. That is the first question that needs to be answered. The second point that brings up that is equally complicating is that for governments in Africa, especially because that's where we work, to know who's doing what in their jurisdiction and to maintain just the paperwork for annual filings, we have to file annually. Our board of directors, our general assembly meetings, our minutes, our financial statements. And does anybody look at them? I can almost assure you nobody does, because I go and ask them, are we compliant for last year? They haven't got a clue what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> then I say to them, well, what percentage should be allocated to development of the local district? Well, what do you think should be done? This is a question that comes back to me. That's a need. I'm not providing a solution, but I'm explaining more of the need of why we need some order around this chaos. Will it add credibility to some select few? Perhaps. And maybe that is a danger. But I think what we need to do is, is not just say, there's enough of an issue and a problem here that we need to drive toward a solution. Not to say it's too complicated, we can't touch it. Because I can assure you it's not being touched now. It's an issue in every country I've been in in Africa. But we don't really know why we have all the NGOs. We really don't know who is behind the NGOs. We don't know what power they exert on the local government and the local authorities. Are they biasing decisions? Yes, they are. I can give you cogent examples of that happening. But should something be done? My belief is yes, it should. Should we have a quick answer? No. It's something that needs, it's taken years to develop. We need some time to resolve it as well over a period of time. That's the best guy so I can give you. Thanks. But, but I kind of follow up when you say you, you do the annual filing and basically there's no one to read. Yes. But I'll take it on the other side, and I'm, it's not in Africa, I'm thinking of Russia. When you basically have a Western based NGO, and the go Russian government is saying uh, you are actually here to. Uh, uh, to promote politics or whatever. Yes. Meaning the other side of Syria basically say everybody has to register or if you do it, you get out. So what, what do you say about that? It's, it's a balance that needs some definition by academia if, and not to pass it on to academia. But it's a theoretical issue. And it's not something that one with experience in a particular part of the world can answer solely. For the case of the Russian bloc, for example, or for Latin America or whatever, the, the scenarios change. And one brush stroke doesn't cover everybody. But I think that what we need to do is acknowledge that we have an issue and a problem. Right now, all we are concerned about at this moment is Africa. We have a problem in Africa that we need to resolve, not just because we are interested in being good citizens, but, but, but because we want their life to become improved and better and better surveillance mechanisms, better use of methodology and funding, and a more transparent system. Okay, thanks. Um, it looks like we're just about out of time. I know there might be maybe one more question, and then we'll, we'll dismiss for lunch. And if there are more questions after that, please feel free to come and chat afterwards or during the lunch break. One more question here. Thank you. Yes, no, thank you again for the wonderful work that you have been just like the previous group. Beautiful work. Highly appreciated. Without this work, there's a lot of people who are suffering out there, and that has to be recognized and appreciated. And I just want to, to say, I've had the two of you have spoken to presidents of the countries, in African countries, which is good I appreciate. What on earth do they say? Why do they always need help? What are they doing, for God's sake, <coughs> to get those countries fixed up? When you engage them, and not being so nice because you have to be nice anyway, that's how you, you respect the village chief, but asking the real question, you guys, what are you doing here? 
Because these are not necessarily, most of them, they are not uneducated people. Most of those people who are running countries in Africa were educated here in the US, in the UK, in Europe. So it's not just for a generation Africa has said people who are not educated. What are they doing? Lastly, you are doing a good job. You are training people for science. 4,000 teachers for maths and science, which is highly needed in Africa. And I cannot show you a half, half of those people, if they had an opportunity, they, they would leave Africa to go and use those skills in Europe and America because their skills would be properly rewarded and recognized. So although we are doing good work out there, these things doesn't seem to be sustainable because as you are saying, the, the, the structure is totally dysfunctional. The political structure, the economic structure, how do we solve this problem? And so that you don't have this influx of the skills that you are busy building in Africa, then people are this brain drain consistently out of Africa with those. Just just a thought. I'm being troubled, I'm not really troubling anybody. I'm troubled myself by these questions. I had to talk. Right. There's just one cause for, for optimism, which is at a certain point, a country can follow the strategy followed by China, which was to bribe their expatriate uh, academics and, and uh, surgeons and you name it to return. And when I say bribe, what laboratory do you need us to build, what salary do you need, et cetera, et cetera. And while there are lots of, of very highly qualified academics in Africa working there, we know, of course, that there are even more in the diaspora. Mm -hmm. So one of the tasks has to be to create an environment where they will return. Yeah. yeah. So, I, I was gonna say, I actually asked the uh, vice president, probably one of the first things I asked, how do you live in a country that is the most fertile in the world? And 95% of your people are starving to death. And his response was that when people are hungry, nothing else matters. You're not thinking about what you can do next week, next month. You're thinking about how do I eat today? When you have no money to buy seed, and you have no money to buy tools, and you have no money to rent or buy land, how do you grow food? Responsibility of the government is to, to solve those long-term problems that yeah. the individuals themselves might be struggling with those issues on a day-to-day, -day and just thinking yeah. how do I well, handle the government's responsibility? Yeah, but, but, in the village that I'm working with, what 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 Cecilia was saying in the eighties, the IMF convinced African government that it was easier to grow for them to buy chicken uh, mm -hmm. made in, in Vietnam mm -hmm. than to have. Somebody growing chickens yeah. at home. That's what. That's what. That's why I'm. When I look at the right. at the green movement, when now everybody is growing their own food, mm -hmm. I say like, uh, do people have amnesia? The IMF was saying that you don't have to grow anything, just just privatize everything, just get the movement to mm -hmm. get out, and now you have this problem. So it's all linked. Yeah. If well, you can't run the government, then don't run. Yeah. Don't be the <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I think that one of the things that we're talking about that we will have to continue over, over lunch are a couple of things I think that we're talking about. But one is this question of the relationship between, you know, we're kind of moving more into those structural issues, yes. right? Yes. Um, but yes. those structural issues have to do with governments and with international yeah. Both the donor community and other kinds of communities and then the local level and those kinds of interactions pose numerous kinds of questions. Uh, Ken, you really want to say something? So can very, I, very can quickly. I close my statement? All right. All right. All right. All right. Don't expect altruism and open honesty and transparency when you're talking to a leader either in Africa or in North America. <laughs> well, I was going to say, there's men, there are many things that are similar. We, we, yeah, we have the bigger middle class here, but you'll find, as Deborah has said, many of the same issues in our cities here, and, and a lot, a lot, a lot of corruption as well. Um, so I want to thank the panel. Sorry, Dan, I'm sorry. Uh, there are four people get up. There are four people get up. Lunch today is sponsored um, by
by uh, Dean Sharon Salinger, who is uh, the Dean of Undergraduate Education, and we will have Marcella Kali uh, speak to us for a few minutes. Uh, Marcella is the director of um, the Study Abroad Center at the University of California, Irvine. I had the pleasure, along with Joe and uh, several others, of going to Ghana uh, with Marcella a couple of years ago. And so she's going to talk for a couple of minutes before we, okay, why don't you do that now, <laughs> about Study Abroad programs. And then what we also want to do is to have anybody who's been on a panel or will be on a panel, um, seek out our UCI students over lunch. UCI students, raise your hands. UCI students, raise your hands. Okay, great. Um, and there will probably be some more filtering in. So if you see people who look like they might be students, converge on them at lunchtime because they want to hear about what it's like to do research in Africa and study in Africa. They want to hear about where you're from, if you're from Africa, or what your work is like um, does that sound good, everybody? And so please feel free to introduce yourselves to our UCI students. That's what lunch is about. And then we'll continue these conversations. So thank you very much. And I think it's, I'm very pleased to introduce Marcella. Thank you, Marcella. I promise I'll only speak for about five minutes because I, I know we all want to eat lunch and, and we, all, we all want to talk some more. Um, but um, so it has really been a pleasure and a privilege for me to be here yesterday and today and to participate in all of these discussions. It has been wonderful. Um, but I want to start by asking a question. Uh, for those of you who are not currently undergraduate students in the room, um, can I see by a show of hands how many of you, when you were an undergraduate student, spent part of your education outside of your home country when you're an undergraduate student? Okay, and keep your hands up. Uh, the rest of you, how many of you spent some time outside of your home country when you were a graduate student? Okay, thank you. So as I imagined, um, in this room, we have a lot of people who are already uh, converts about the value of studying <coughs> abroad uh, for students. Um, but I want to share just a few thoughts about that while we're all here together. Um, and some of the challenges that we face at UCI with uh, setting abroad, and in particular, setting abroad in Africa. <laughs> um, so yesterday morning, Googie shared with us his mother's wisdom um, regarding why it matters to study abroad. He said that she always said, if you never traveled, you always think your mother's cooking is the best. <laughs> right? Uh, so we need our students um, to, to go out and question what they've always understood to be the best their mother's cooking, their form of government, uh, their healthcare system in their country, whatever it is. Um, and to break out of that ethnocentric position that uh, what they know is best. Um, and so when students have an opportunity to go study abroad, as all you all know, um, they ha when they stay long enough in a place, they have an opportunity to begin to develop relationships with people there and begin to start to understand how the society functions there. Um, and most importantly, they begin to be able to see the world from another perspective, from another viewpoint. So from a French perspective, from the perspective of Thailand, of Ghana, of South Africa, of Tanzania, they can see it somewhere, see the world, and see the United States differently than they see it when they only look out from the United States and have only seen it from an American perspective. Yesterday, Chris Abani explained that Africa is inexplicable to the rest of the world because other countries only measure Africa against themselves. Our students need to go to Africa and live and study there to begin to understand Africa on its own terms from the perspective of Nigerians, Senegalese, Tanzanians, etc. Most Americans know very little about Africa. <laughs> There are very few opportunities in most American universities to learn the history, social institutions, political institutions, art, music, dance of the African countries. At UCI, for example, in a given academic year, we have about four classes that have the word Africa in the title. Four in the whole academic year. Um, like many of you, I did study abroad when I was a student, and I studied in France. And that's when I began to learn about Africa. When I went to France, I found that my classmates, many of them, were African. 
Um, and I met one in particular who was very special and became my husband. Oh. 20 years. <laughs> uh, from Algeria. Um, and um, when I come to conferences like this, it always reinforces for me how important it is for students who are interested in these topics to go and live and study in the place, in Africa. Last night, there's so many examples from the conference already, but last night we heard from Sophia Zeb and Victoria Bernal about the role of music and humor in social protest and political critique. And once again, I was reminded that if you do not understand the cultural concept, cons context, none of it makes any sense. You can't understand the musical expression of protest or the humor in another culture if you haven't lived there and understand the historical and cultural context that it's in. It doesn't make any sense. So you have to be there and live it and relate to people and under begin to have relationships and know the place for it to make sense. Last night we talked about the meaning of tribe and of ethnicity and democracy. But it's one thing to understand what academics think all of those things mean. It's another thing to understand what the people living yes. there every day, yes. what it means to Correct. them in their context. You have to go and be there with them and engage with them in their daily life and see things happen to them as they go through life to have it make any sense. Um, when I was... Um, when I went, went to South Africa with a bunch of other study abroad professionals, um, Americans, we spent about 20 minutes trying to get them to explain to us what the racial category colored meant. Mm -hmm. we, we couldn't understand it, and, and we said, how do you know if a person's in that category? Mm -hmm. And I realized that you can't just ask a question and get an answer and have it make sense. You have to be there and live it and begin to have it make sense. I was fortunate enough to be in Algeria when Algeria had its first multi-party election. And I was a student of political science, and, and for me to be there and hear people talk about their skepticism about participating in the election and their mistrust that it would have any value. You know, last night we were talking about democracy and what does it mean and how can we develop in, in Africa. And, and I saw from my own eyes from someone who always thought, you know, democracy, democracy, who would question that, right? You know, they, they didn't believe in it, they didn't think it could happen, you know, and I had to be there and hear the conversation to begin to have that make any sense to me. So the point of all of this is that we need our students to go and live for long enough in Africa to have, build relationships, go through the experiences that happen in the moment that they're there, to have it have meaning for them, and then to be able to do meaningful things out of that. Um, so fortunately for UCI students, and for most of the universities that you all are from in the United States at least, those students do have the opportunity to go and study in Africa. Um, they can go and take classes, engage with the, the local student population, get involved in voluntary service, all kinds of things while they're there. They can go in the summer, they can go during the academic year, uh, they can go on short-term programs like Engineers Without Borders or other uh, global brigades and things like that. And sometimes there's an inspired faculty member who may take a group of students to do a specific thing for a period of time to learn, like dance, and we'll hear probably about that in the next panel, I believe. Um, but at UCI, we have a challenge. In any given semester, we have about an average of three UCI students studying in Africa. Only three. So um, yesterday, Vice Chancellor Parham told us that when he talks to students about coming to UCI, he challenges them to be a part of the quest to be global leaders of tomorrow. So our challenge is to have more of our students go out and, and live away from here and, and understand it. And we can do it if we employ this division of labor. So here's the division of labor I have to, to, to offer to you all. First of all is the role of the faculty to inspire and motivate the students to have the curiosity to learn about Africa and to understand the value of being there is what's gonna really help them learn about it. So it's the faculty's job to inspire them, motivate them, and get them to understand that. The students who've studied abroad in the past, and several of them were here yesterday actually at the conference, it's their job to talk and talk and talk about what it meant to them, how it's impacted them, share what they've learned and how they think and see differently because of that. It's my job at the Study Abroad Center to help the students understand what the options are. Where can they exactly go? Which classes they, can they take which is gonna help them still graduate? How can they use their financial aid? What kind of scholarships are available? All that kind of thing. And then it's the student's job to be brave and courageous 
to go out and confront the unknown and the uncomfortable with an open mind and an open heart and take that chance. Thank you very much.